All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So first of all, Skyfrog, how are you doing? Rima, how are you doing? John, how are you doing? And if anyone else, I, I think Kelly, um, have you uh, recovered? And I saw someone else today as well. My apologies. Um, I hope everyone is doing fine. Uh, my friend that I discussed, who was in the hospital for the last nine days in Dubai. So finally, uh, they started her on Fevi Piravir. They did a PCR and her, she was still positive after 10 days of hospitalization. And she had the virus before that. She went to hospital just for a general checkup that, hey, I'm not able to breathe fine and please make sure that I'm okay. And they admitted her. So then um, yesterday they did another test that came in negative. Today they did one more test and that came in positive. However, so they extended her stay for five more days. But she was on oxygen. Oxygen is stopped. She's now able to walk around and work and, you know, take some exertion. So that is a good news on her end. How are folks doing here? Dr. Z, how are you doing? Uh, Dr. Z, I was requesting you that day if you can have one more session with us. Would that be possible? John, how are you doing? Texas, how are you doing? <laughs> okay, so let's do this. I wanted to look at the cases and the progress. So let's start from the country where when I'll do it, many people would give me many comments and that is UK. So how is UK doing? Meanwhile, our world in data, our world in data, it is UK. And Paul, Paul Bork and, and family, they are also, uh, I think, recovering. So Paul, good wishes and prayers to you as well. So while I look at that, Mimi, a quick question. Do you know of any tests in US to see if I had Delta or O? I had mild COVID, but he knows me are starting day five. So doctors suspected it was Delta, even though mild and Delta waning in Bay Area. It is actually not 100% necessary that Omicron cannot cause anosmia, but usually anosmia is associated with Delta. Now to your question, what we have to see is, I'm not aware of it. But what we have to see is which kits have one signal failing on them. And you can see that from South Africa, or you can see that from UK. So if you just Google the kits, actually you, UK's technical briefings have the kit name that they used to see, to kind of as a flag for this being an Omicron. Of course, the right thing is to do the sequencing. But before the sequencing, this was sort of a flag for them. My only question is, are, do you still have the virus? If you have the virus, you can probably either get it sequenced or use the kit. If the virus is gone, then you don't have a way. There is no other test. It will be interesting to see the antibodies against Omicron if they are the same. Uh, but that would be, for example, Omicron antibodies protect against Delta, but not others or lesser for the previous ones. So if really this is needed, then antibodies, which I'm sure you have them, antibodies should be taken, then they should be put on the viruses before Delta. And if they don't do much, then it is Omicron. But that's a very involved test. So Dr. Z says, definitely. Thank you very much. So we will reach out to you. Thank you very much for this. John says, I'm fine, but frustrated. Uh, wishing you well. Uh, get well soon. This is the first time in the cool beans we have such a wave relatively more because cool beans, usually we had been staying very protected and very safe during this time. I'm sure that we are still safe and protected, but there are more around us that have it. Okay, so um, I wanted to look at, oh, I have a question for you. The 
um, the diagrams that I made in the last lecture, the background, I changed it to sort of yellowish. Does that look better or this white background, where is it? <laughs> this white background, is this better? So please tell me of how you think about this. Okay, so UK, confirmed cases. Look at the spike. So now, daily confirmed cases. Previous waves look like baby waves now for UK. So the 181,442. And I should do this, although I always get criticized ever if I talk about US, but it is only fair to talk about United States as well, because we had 1 million cases. Although those 1 million cases included the cases for the weekend because they were not reported over the weekend, but still. So 553, 773 on January 4. Okay, so back here to UK, 181,000. And let's see. These are the cases. Cumulative number. I always am interested in the cumulative number because I consider that to be part of the herd immunity, 13.67 million. And Doug would say that my mouse is um, like a duck. Duck, I said. Um, I still have to buy that mouse, which doesn't have the sound. Okay, so here, daily deaths are on, on the, so lesser than the previous waves. Although the UK started somewhere in the middle of the December. So middle of January is when actual numbers could be looked at, but still there is a tiny bit of a upturn and then back so far. So if I put it in perspective, if I look at this, so compared to previous waves, remember you saw that the cases were, the current case number, makes the other waves look like babies. But current death number is still a baby number compared to previous waves. And I wish and pray that it stays that, that way. We'll have to wait for some more weeks. So that is UK, US, US. So numbers, a lot. And then, when did, sorry, so I'm gonna, let me scroll with the thumbnail so doesn't make that much of a noise. Um, when did we start going upwards? December, really December 18, 19, when cases started going upwards. Of course, the virus must have been, if this is Omicron, it must have been in the society a little more before. Still, there are lots of cases that are Delta, but December 18, 19 is when US numbers started rising, which are going to be Omicron. And that means January third week will be the one to look at. And I hope and pray that nobody loses their life. This is such a traumatic event. So US also, so far, the number of deaths are, they did not have an uptick and we'll wait. How about South Africa? So South Africa's wave has almost come down, 8,436 for the whole South Africa. Remember at one point, Kautang had just the Kautang had 13,000-ish per day. So now the whole South Africa has 8,400. And if I go to the death rate, you can see there is a slight upturn now. So November 24th is when they 
disclosed or said that they discovered it. And yes, it was in Botswana. I think it, it was even in other countries before it. So I'm not saying they are the ones that had it, but they announced it. So from November 24, they their own research workers use mid-November or even the whole month of November. But let's use mid-November onwards. Then mid-December onwards, for, for example, here, December 18, 19 onwards, these are upturns in the death rate but that death rate is still really low compared to the previous ones which is a good news and i let's see what happens with this upturn over here this upturn is january 485 and what is the lowest in these recent days december 2949 so almost doubled in so january 432 in 6 7 days so we'll see So Kelly says, uh, people I know are being prescribed Z-Packs, but I've heard conflicting opinions on antibiotics or COVID treatment. What are your thoughts? So I know that the z pack started getting prescribed when the Dr. Alam from Bangladesh started combining it. Remember, there was a, a concept of, uh, was it doxycycline in Kelly's study or azithromycin? So he had used one, I think he had used azithromycin. And then Dr. Alam tried doxycycline. So azithromycin was used in the Kelly study in that at that time with ivermectin to say that azithromycin potentiated the effect of ivermectin by about five times. From there, doctors picked up azithromycin as something to use, but they dropped ivermectin. And secondly, Many times when we have viral infections of respiratory system, there are secondary infections as well, bacterial infections that start as well. And it is actually useful to keep those secondary infections blocked so that, or at bay, so that the person's, the person already becomes fatigued and tired and their, their, their health goes down very fast with COVID. So if there is a supra infection or secondary infection, then that causes even more issue. So I think there are two reasons for this z pack being prescribed. One, doctors want to keep the second infections at bay. And secondly, there has been a, a z pack has become ingrained in our psyche since the Kelly study. Margaret says noise is not a problem in, on this end. Okay, I hope I am not causing noise uh bambi says just catching up on double speed bambi how are you doing how was your your birthday and then the rest of the days so pearl purple swirl says has dr bean discussed the new ihw ihu variant in france with 46 mutations i have not but it is not really new it was actually before Omicron. It has these mutations. It is not faster than Omicron. It was actually not even faster than Delta. The interesting thing is it is found in a traveler now as well. It was known to WHO and others beforehand, but it was not a variant of concern. So it got news media, some cycles and some clicks, but generally that virus itself has been observed for some time and Omicron is faster than that, that means IHU will find it difficult to take over Omicron, but we'll see. John Johnson says mid-December deaths won't show until mid to late January, yes. So, and I hope, John, everybody stays safe. Lizzie B says, question, my sister-in-law said that the monoclonal antibody infusion is the exact same as the vaccination. That sounded incorrect to me. That is correct. It should sound incorrect. She said that the ingredients are the same. Can you please clarify? So, no, uh, let's, let's clarify. Good question. Allows me to draw. <laughs> Any question that makes me draw is fun question. So um, let's have 
a line on the paper and let's say vaccine and monoclonal antibody when the vaccine is formed they make i mean i'm talking about messenger rna vaccines for example they make the they take the genetic material for spike protein and they wrap it up into a nanoparticle then that particle goes into our cells that causes let's say we make two boxes here one of the box this is the innate arm and the other box is the the what is that acquired arm innate arm acquired arm so what happens is when the vaccine is given the innate arm picks up the lipid nanoparticle and the rna goes into the cell as well and that rna helps make these spike proteins or spike proteins are then broken up into pieces shown on the surface innate arm becomes active then it causes the acquired arm to become active acquired arm then causes and cool beans know when i'm drawing this this map we always draw it this way so here is the humoral answer or humoral arm humoral part and this is the cytotoxic part so there is response adaptive arms response right so this is the vaccine so we call it active because it has trained the immune system to produce the antibodies or activate the cytotoxic t cells on demand when the exposure occurs two months later three months later then this would happen although with omicron now we are seeing that the efficacy is reducing but that's a different discussion the this is the way vaccines work so that is called active immunization because your body is trained for immunization one second very important part and i'm i'm looking there as well to see my drawing does not get cut by the comment that is displayed i keep the comment there to make sure that i can address the parts of the comment so let's say this is the spike protein and in the spike protein we know that there is receptor binding domain and there is s1 and there is s2 correct and there are other uh, vaccines as well for example full uh, virus vaccine inactivated vi vaccine then there is adeno adenovirus based vaccines also have the rna in them at the end of the day they will make spike protein too so the point i'm going to make here is that the antibodies that will be produced are going to be polyclonal polyclonal mean and it's not just the antibody it's going to be t cells as well polyclonal means that these can bind to various parts of the spike protein, not just one part. Good. So vaccine is active. Vaccine is polyclonal. And it depends upon what is the vaccine presenting. So how polyclonal will depend upon what part of the virus is exposed to our body. If it is just a spike protein, then the vaccine will make antibodies against the spike protein. If it is in an inactivated virus, then our vaccines or our body will generate spike uh, antibodies against many parts of the virus, inactivated virus. So the, vac the antibody types will be called polyclonal because they have many variations to them. So that is the vaccine. And then we know that these antibodies that will be produced, they will then live on for some time. The antibody itself, the antibody itself, if I make that here, the antibody itself can live on for three weeks, four weeks, sometimes six weeks. But the cells that have become trained will now live on for a longer period of time as memory cells. And so four months, five months, six months, Again, this is all debatable now that how many months, but let's just use generic term to be able to answer your question. Four months, six months, year, the, the memory cells are sitting in the system and when the exposure occurs, they would start making antibodies. Again, those antibodies, when they will be made, will then live in our body for three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and so on. Good? So that is a vaccine. Vaccine has adjuvants. Those adjuvants job is to kind of kick the, the immune system somewhere to kind of rattle it, to say, get up and do something. 
I have brought this antigen for you. And so usually adjuvant's function is to intensify the immune response by having immune activators, chemotactic factors, and other such things. That is a vaccine. Now, if you go to monoclonal antibodies, they are called passive immunization. And the very first thing is that they usually have one or two antibodies in them. Monoclonal means one clone. That means one binding unit, one binding site. Nowadays, monoclonals are actually two. How do they make them? They actually take, let's say there is a patient of COVID. That patient handled their infection very well. The researchers would ask that patient to donate their plasma, blood, and they would take out the antibodies from this patient. And of course, the patient would present hundreds of kinds of antibodies because their body was making uh, antibodies against the virus, various parts. So researchers' job now is out of those hundreds of antibodies, try to figure out which antibodies are the most potent ones, most effective ones. So they can you imagine their hard work? They go antibody by antibody, expose them to the virus uh, spike, see what neutralizes it, how intensely. And then out of those hundreds of those antibodies, they would filter out and they would select one or two antibodies that are the most potent. Once they have done this, then they give these antibodies formula, the RNA part, to bacteria. And they, they put a plasmid in the bacteria. And I've done these discussions in the past. That is why I'm kind of being a little more uh, brief about them. Not brief about the whole answer, but I'm not going in detail for every mechanism. So they give the plasmid to the bacteria that can make this antibody, and this bacteria would start churning out these antibodies. When these antibodies are now formed, they're called monoclonal because all the antibody will have the same binding region on them, same binding region. And they could probably have two such sets, and then they would have really biclonal, and they would put them in a bottle, and that becomes the antibody, bottle or monoclonal antibody. Now, when somebody becomes sick, if I become sick today, giving me vaccine is of no use, unless I was vaccinated before, and this would act like a booster, but then the infection itself is going to act like a booster. However, if I'm sick today, and they want to quickly wrap up the virus, they can give monoclonal antibody monoclonal antibody is passive immunization. These antibodies have one kind of binding region or at least maybe just two and they go in and they start binding with the viruses by proteins and they start wiping out the virus, mopping up the virus and there is a lot of functions, biological functions occur. These antibodies are also modified in ways to be able to live longer. For example, AstraZeneca's antibodies according to AstraZeneca can live on for five, six, eight months and provide protection, that has become longer than the vaccine nowadays. But these antibodies will not train our immune system to make more antibodies when needed. These antibodies will wane away, will be destroyed, usually three to four weeks, but these are modified antibodies to be able to live on for a couple of months, AstraZeneca six months. Will they train our immune system? No. Will they live on forever? No. And the most important thing is that these antibodies, monoclonal, can fail faster than the vaccines in case of mutation. Why? For example, let's take Omicron as an example. Omicron has made mutations which are causing some antibodies even generated by the vaccine to be not very firmly attached to the spike protein and so efficacy is reduced. Plus, we have, to, we have to keep in mind, Omicron is not defeating the vaccine ju just by mutations because it is faster. Sometimes our body is at rest and is not able to produce the antibodies that fast. It would take a couple of days, 10 hours to 48 hours 
to ramp up and start making antibodies. If in the meantime, Omicron has started creating the replication and tissue damage, then Omicron can win. Fortunate for us that Omicron usually is not that severe. Okay, back here. Uh, Omicron is still causing people to die, so please don't take this as a as a endorsement that it's always not severe in people. It can be severe. People are dying from that too. Okay, so back here. Passive immunization, temporary immunization, immediate instantaneous immunization or help is what is monoclonal. And they fail faster as well because for Omicron, these antibodies, monoclonal, are really just attaching to one part. So let's say if I make a spike protein over here. And let's say this antibody binds here. Let me make it blue. Let's say it binds here. And now the virus made a change in this area, Omicron. Then this antibody is not going to be able to bind here. And now this monoclonal has failed. Vaccine can still have the efficacy because it might produce multiple kinds of antibody. But monoclonal is gone. If it is gone. If it is not gone, for example, the virus has made the changes here and the monoclonal binds here, then it is fine. And this is why... Um, what are these? Lily came out and they said our efficacy has dropped because it's really one binding site. And if that has changed, then the binding is gone. Uh, similarly, Regeneron came out and said our efficacy is reduced as well, or they're not even offering in some cases. So, and they are going to change it. So, I hope that answers this question. Huge difference. And usually, so the question now when are you going to give monoclonal antibodies? Anybody who is at risk and needs the virus to be mopped up right away. We cannot wait for the immune system to become active and take care of the virus, or we are not sure it can take care of the virus. Then we give the antibodies monoclonal to quickly clear out. But monoclonals also have adjuvants or they also have things that can cause reaction. Monoclonals usually have infusions. Monoclonal can fail as well monoclonal are not necessary to bind the same way in everyone. So there are limitations of monoclonal as well, but they are really important. We saw with Trump, for example, they used monoclonal. We saw with, uh, what is his lawyer? He used monoclonal. Many people use monoclonal, although nowadays it is res restricted. So more instantaneous, vaccine more long-term, active immunity, passive immunity, one kind of binding site, multiple binding sites, training of immune system, not training of the immune system, memory cell production, no memory cell production, no cytotoxic cell production, no B cell production in case of the monoclonal. So I hope that gives you an idea of how different they are, hugely different. <laughs> Skyfrog says a drawing question. When you draw the increase in antibodies, you draw them rapidly increasing and leveling. Shouldn't it be more like sine t? Yes. So yeah, I just make them the way we used to study in our um, textbooks. In the textbook, if you see, so if I go here, let's say, let's say IgM, IgG, Pattern and just go to some images, you would see that many times they would appear like this, go up and down and up and down. So, uh, of course, there are more, uh, as you said, there are correct plots, but we, we are used to looking at it this way to say, okay, now the antibody started getting produced. First, IgM comes in. Then a little later, IgG comes in and stays up, and then sometimes a vein, and then IgE, for example, hepatitis IgE is over here, and so on. So, uh, not IgE, but to the capsule. So, that is how I am used to building these charts. So, good catch, Skyfrog. 
Dana King says, thank you for that explanation on monoclonal antibodies versus vaccine. The NP who gave them to me said they teach your body to make more antibodies. No, actually, Regeneron, and I see your uh, uh, sad um, expression, so I hope it is okay. They cannot teach the body. Actually, Regeneron said it on their leaflet that your future response to the actual infection might be diminished. I'm paraphrasing whatever was their correct verbiage. And what they mean is this. As soon as the virus comes in and we give this monoclonal antibody and the monoclonal antibody quickly goes and wipes up, wipes out the virus and binds to it. And our, our immune system doesn't get enough chance to bind to the virus because now it is coated with these antibodies. That means our immune system had a smaller dose of the virus exposed to it. And that means it will not develop as intense a response as possible. Just like vaccine one dose versus two dose versus three dose. Because of that, there is no guarantee that in the future, the exposure would keep the immune system or will make the immune system respond as better because there is some training done because of the viral exposure, not the this antibody's exposure. If there is a virus and the antibody is given, then the exposure to the actual virus, but smaller dose will not train the immune system as intensely. So future response could be weaker. You could think of this as one dose of a vaccine. Paul Borg says, we will faster through the whole disease cycle, but I agree this very likely. Okay, so some side. I hope, Paul, you're doing well. Uh, Helen says, Dr. Wien, can you please explain the difference between R0 and RT? I've never understood. Okay, so R0 and RT. Let's see. We've written R not as R not. I don't want to do a full modeling exercise. I'm just trying to see if I can show up, show an image. Okay, so okay, so let's do this. I wanted some bigger image that I can use but I'm just going to draw. So let's do it. So R0, or reproduction number, is the virus's capability to go from one person to how many people. And that going from one to as many defines what is the R0, correct? And from there, we develop the herd immunity. RT is the capability. So let's say over here in R0, we are saying one person infected will be able to give it to four people. That is the virality of the or the contagiousness of the virus. The It is a respiratory type virus. It can get out even just by laughing or talking versus sneezing or coughing. So the characteristics of the virus and the person's interaction with that will develop R0. On the other hand, RT will also take into account if I have it and the virus is actually R04, that means very transmissible, but I never get out of the home. Now, for me, this virus is sitting at an R0 of zero because I'm not giving it to anyone. So this effective R0, and if there are more people behaving this way, then even when the virus had, if given a chance, can go from one people to four, it is still not being able to go from one to four because people are wearing, let's say, mask or they are doing social distancing or they're staying at home or other things, whatever they feel, or they are vaccinated and protected or previous infection and protected or whatever. So the result is that effective or not drops, let's say, to two. So that would be the difference. This is a very, very interesting question, Carlos. Dr. Bean, if I remember correctly, most of the issues with AstraZeneca thrombocytopenia happen as part of the first dose. Am I correct? 
um, I think thrombocytopenia occurred with the first dose and myocarditis mostly with the second dose. That's what I remember as well. I can do digging if it is an important um, data to see. Rima says, a doctor virologist I spoke to today said, kids are getting sicker with Omicron versus Delta A all because it's an adenovirus type and little ones don't have protection from adenovirus. Plausible? No. Because if we take the adenovirus as the cause, then Omicron and Delta are the same thing. Of course, they're not the... So if it is adenovirus type, let's use that statement, then they both are that way. Omicron's changes have not made it turn into a different species. So this logic is incorrect. Why kids are becoming more um, sick would be a different pathogenesis. It may be just like we talked about R0 and RT. It may be that kids were less exposed before. It may be more just in general population is becoming more infected right now in cool beans we have so many who are sick we never saw that for one and a half year so maybe just the increase number so there, there can be many factors upper respiratory tract infection kids actually have it more commonly schools many other factors but this is the type will be the same for both <laughs> Kelly says, I miss Alquin's turtles. And he would sometimes make sheep as well, a uh, little ram. Aero says, does previous Delta infection only provide protection from severe disease and not reinfection? There is no previous infection or vaccine that can protect from reinfection. The only time a person will not know that they got reinfected is when the immune system is in active state and they and the body is making body is making antibodies I'm, I'm trying to see what was i going to draw so igas so let's say these are igas right with this secretory component igas In the mucous membranes, we have IgAs. <clears throat> In the blood and tissue, we have IgM and mostly IgG. In mother's milk, we have IgA. Through the placenta, we are sending IgG. So that all is an active state. There are cytotoxic T cells that are sitting and saying, I just need the virus somewhere, I'm gonna attack it. In this condition, when the immune system is active, you expose the patient to more virus, then immune system would react to it. And because patient is already going through this, patient would not know that there, is, there was more infection. On the other hand, if a person had the infection or vaccine, let's say they had the infection here. Then they gave it some time. <laughs> Skyfrog, please forgive me for making these antibodies like this. So let's say they make the, this is the immune system's response. And then, um, now I become conscious about this, <laughs> this plot. So here, and then the immune system starts waning out, right? And so when it has waned out, over here, the immune system is at rest. The amount of antibodies are less. And if they get reinfected, in, in, infection simply mean exposure to the virus again. The virus landing on the mouth, in the mouth, nose, eyes, right? What, we cannot stop from that, from a previous infection or from a vaccine, unless a person is dead. There's no further chance of reinfection. But a healthy person moving about would get reinfected if another person is carrying it and, and transmitting through their breath. Now, when this happens, over here, what is the outcome? Some people will have asymptomatic outcome. And so they would not even know they were reinfected. Some people will become ill again, but for lesser symptoms, lesser duration. Some people will become ill with greater, du 
duration of symptoms as well. Some people would even die who were infected before and now again or vaccinated and infected. So, uh, Arrow, it really depends upon the state of the person's immune system. Uh, so, if I go back to your question, does previous Delta infection only provide protection from severe disease and not reinfection? So, nothing would provide protection from reinfection. It's just a state of immune system. Active immune system, reinfection will occur, but we'll not know. Hopefully, passive or resting immune system, reinfection will occur and we'll know as well. Some people would not know even in that case because asymptomatic is a possibility. <laughs> Sky Frog says, vampires are dead. Are, are they? Yeah, that's a good question. Are vampires viruses then? <laughs> Wapa Bamir says, after COVID, when is the booster vaccine recommended? I don't want another jab, but employer now requires boosters. I just had COVID two weeks ago. Wow. So there are uh, various country rules. For example, in some countries, they say three months after. But really, if you had COVID, let's say two weeks ago, your immune system is still in an active state. If you expose it, I just talked about it. If you expose it again to something, it might respond to it at this time and you might get some symptoms again. It might even not even care because the immune system has all the antibodies already present. So it really depends this, at the state of the immune system. Um, the rules in the other countries were to give a break to people to say, we recognize that your infection is protective for this many months and after that please have a vaccine so we can think that you are continuing with the protection so here the so if you said what is the downside of it the only downside is your immune system is active taking a vaccine might cause the immune system to become jittery and say okay i'm going to respond very quickly and you might get more symptoms at the same time the active immune system with the active IgG, IgM, mostly IgG, with IgE, with I IgA, you might not even know. And the immune system would just pick up the antigen that comes in and say bye-bye, and you have something on the paper. GB says, sir, my family had a bad fever with flu-like symptoms in the past after I got the first dose and now after 11 months of vaccine. My IgG antibodies increased by five times without second shot. Was it COVID? It is possible that that was an exposure if they just increased. If they were not that way before, but then all of a sudden they increased, that means you may have an asymptomatic exposure. I like Skyfrog's question, are vampires dead or are they? And then connection to the virus, is the virus dead or are they? Um, I, so a few days ago, we talked about the virus and are they alive or not? And so some folks wrote very philosophical comments under the video to say, here is the philosophy of the dead things or alive things. And they explained to me that how me even thinking like this is wrong. <laughs> this is a very good question. Technical 108 says, Dr. Bean, can you please explain after neutrophils or any other immunological cell, immune cell, destroy bacteria, where does the debris go? <laughs> good question. So let's see. So here comes a bacteria. Let's make it red in color. So we can track it. So this is a bacteria. Correct and it arrived in our body here we have a let's start with the neutrophil we have a neutrophil neutrophil i call them irresponsible friends why they are irresponsible friends let's give it a big smile oh look at look at this neutrophil's beautiful smile 
Okay, so this neutrophil is an irresponsible friend. Why? It is going to pick up this bacteria and it would do a few things with it. First of all, it will do something that we say oxygen burst, correct? And that is a test to see if the neutrophils are working correctly. Some people who get repeated infections, they are tested to see if their neutrophils are working correctly or not, or are they doing oxygen burst correctly or not. So what happens is this is a phagosome in which this little bacteria is sitting, and then neutrophil make oxygen radicals and they just blast this thing and destroy it. So this much you said, debris. Now, what is the second part of it? What happens to this debris? In case of neutrophils, they are such fun cells that they simply regurgitate that debris. They open it up, their vesicles, and they just throw it out, the broken pieces. They just throw them. They are the ones who, if they were going on a highway, they will be given lots of tickets for, for causing, uh, throwing trash around, for littering. So they, they leave it out. This is actually useful for our body. Why? Because one, they have destroyed the pathogen. So they killed it. Good. The antigen that they threw out, this antigen will be picked up by other cells of the immune system. and a response would start. So macrophages can come in and say, oh, wow, there is some antigen over here. I'm going to pick this antigen up and eat it up. And then the macrophages would go to the lymph node and they would cause the adaptive arm to work. At the same time, macrophages can eat it up and clear it as well. So that is one possibility of debris clearing. So when you say, well, macrophage, how would that magically clear it? Normally, our cells can continue to break down these pathogens' parts to the point that they become final amino acids. We can even break down further, but most of the time these amino acids are then recycled in building other things. So this is like taking bricks from the broken bacteria and building our own machinery with that. So that is one possibility. We can even use those amino acids to further tear them apart and use their carbons and use other parts to build other things. One outcome. Second outcome, and I am now assuming that adaptive arm worked and cytotoxic arm worked and it is four or five days later and now antibodies are being produced. Those antibodies would start coming and attaching to the debris present here. And then this antibody antibody antigen complex will tumble around in our body and it would go around and it would get you know um, cleared out by macrophages in the spleen most of the time they would eat up this whole complex and then destroy this antibody plus this antigen and once again bring it down to the shredded pieces amino acids and then reuse them to build other things or even release them those small pieces back out in the blood. So that means they're shredded to pieces and pieces are something that body doesn't mind. Amino acids, we use them. And it's not just the amino acid metabolism. There are other metabolisms as well. So depending upon what part of the bacteria is being broken, it would depend what part of the metabolism system is working. Okay, so that is two. This is with the neutrophil. So what neutrophil did was useful. Now imagine there are some pathogens that are picked up by macrophages, not the neutrophil. Macrophage is not that irresponsible like a neutrophil. It's not a littering cell. What it would do is it would pick up the antigen, similarly like a neutrophil, in the phagosome. And then it would also break it down. But then it would load the broken thing on MHC2 and MHC1. Remember that macrophages are nucleated. So being a nucleated cell, so this is a nucleus. Being a nucleated cell, it can produce, it can load things on MIC1. All nucleated cells can load antigens on MIC1. So because macrophage is a nucleated cell as well, it can do that on MIC1. But a more important function of a macrophage is 
to load it on MIC2. So it is loaded here in the broken, in the compartment where it is broken. Right over there, this compartment is then merged with other compartments where it is, this broken parts are loaded up on the uh, macrophages MHC2 and then presented outwards. So that is good. You can say, all oh, right, not everything is going to be presented. Where, where are the rest of the parts? Same thing like neutrophil, the rest of the parts will then be totally neutrophil regurgitates them. Macrophage will not do it, but it would take those pieces of it and it would use them for other things. So that is how the virus or bacteria is gone. Similar is the behavior with the dendritic cell as well. Now, those antigens and antibody complexes that would be forming again as a result of macrophage function, same behavior, they will tumble around. In a normal way, they would be picked up by other macrophages and cleared out. In an abnormal way, these can, these antigen antibody complexes, these guys, let's say this is antigen, and this is the binding region of the antibody. This complex could be, <coughs> excuse me, this complex have many fates. For example, it can bind on the surface of a macrophage, right? So these are the um, FC gamma receptors. Fraction crystalline or fraction constant part, which is this part of the antibody, and it binds here. So the heater just started, and that just blows directly on my face and causes me to cough. Excuse me. So the uh, the FC portion becomes bound to macrophage, and then macrophage would internalize it and phagocytose it and do some action as well, and then break it up as well. So that is another possibility. Then these things can go and lodge abnormally. They can lodge, for example, one common area where they can cause a problem is the endothelial cell. Remember, these are tumbling around. So let's say this is an area of damage. Here in the tissue, a, an infection is occurring. Because of that, there is this complexes being formed. Because this area has actual infection and there is inflammation and cytokines, the blood vessel here is going to be a little more permeable because blood vessel is a little dilated and permeable to bring nutrition and more fluids and take debris away. And in that process, these antibody complexes with antigen will enter the blood vessel as well. From there, they can actually lodge, they can settle on the endothelial cells. And wherever they settle, immune system response would get triggered there. A macrophage would come in and get attached there and then the whole hell breaks loose and this area would become damaged. So they can cause vasculitis, but in this process, they will be cleared out as well. Then, as I said, spleen. A lot of these, uh, these things go to spleen. Spleen has macrophages that are going to clean it, clear it out. Then kidney. So I have been talking about this a couple of times before as well. Inside the kidney, there is a filtration system. And that filtration system is not just in the kidney. For example, the joint fluid is made with the filtration system as well. Then blood-brain barrier and the, the tissue fluids in the brain are a result of a filtration system too. So we have filtration systems in many places in our body. So wherever those filtration membranes are present, these antigen-antibody complexes can get lodged there because they're not allowed to pass through them. When they get lodged over there, the immune system reaction would start, macrophages would come and get attached to this antibody and they start releasing the cytokines and the disease would start. So that means kidney damage can occur, that means vasculitis can occur, that means blood-brain barrier damage can occur. So, but we don't see this damage every single time. So it is not necessary that every debris clearing has this problem. This is abnormal. Most of the time, these mechanisms that I showed you, they are the ones that clear the debris away. And then useless parts are just thrown away. I mean, it is brought down, down to the carbon levels and the amino acid levels and the more basic lipids. And so if our body can use them, we use them. 
anything extra is thrown out. Good question, technical. Good technical question. Uh, William Brightweight says, you reviewed Enovoid -no nasal spray. Will it be good to use now? Along? If that nasal spray, I think it, it was, um, what was the name of that? Sanitize. Um, it will be good nowadays to use, yes, if it is available. I think in some, Israel and UK, it is available. Canada, maybe also. Vitaly says, how does the vaccine prevent a cytokine storm? Beautiful. So today we have the best questions. So thank you very much. Um, so how does a vaccine prevent a, a storm? So first of all, we are seeing that some people who are vaccinated can also become uh, severely ill and die. That is their fragility. That is their may not even be the storm. That may be the immune system didn't even respond back good enough and the virus caused the damage. Or this could be storm as well. But generally what happens is, how does the storm occur? So here we have the virus. And the virus, and there are multiple kinds of storms, right? So there is a cytokine storm with the macrophage activation syndrome, or there could be a bradykinin storm that Dr. Fareed Jalali is a big fan of, right? So here is the virus. Virus came into our body, and that virus will cause immune system to become bothered. So macrophage will pick it up, and then we know the whole process of innate arm and acquired arm. What we want to understand is this. The adaptive arm, acquired arm, and the innate arm, they start activating each other. by um, They start amplifying each other. They're, it is their function to amplify each other. But the virus causes such dysregulation of inflammatory and uh, anti-inflammatory mechanisms because it uses ACE2 as well. And that in itself causes the imbalance of the inflammation and anti-inflammation. The end result is it really keeps triggering in some people to the point of a storm. Now, ACE2 mechanism is true for everyone. So if that is the only mechanism for the storm, then everyone should have a storm. So it is not just the ACE2 part. There is more that we do not know. Now, when the vaccine is given or a previous infection had occurred and the person had the antibodies or the immune system, what will happen is immune system is not going to look at this over two weeks or one week time. Immune system is going to attack this very fast within a couple of days. And so the dose of the virus that is able to attach to cells and cause them to be bothered and the immune system to be triggered, that amount of virus will be less. And because of that, that we would have less immune systems dysregulation. That is how it would help. Now, once again, as I said before, it still can cause this in some people. Good questions. Pancake, this is a good question and I have no answer. Is there any information for the efficacy of inactivated virus vaccines like CoronaVac against Omicron yet? No, at least not that I know of, especially compared to mRNA vaccine. No, I do not know. And unfortunately, you know that at least in the West, uh, mRNA are uh, preferred. Today, there are good questions. Mark Rice has a very good question. How does the over-the-counter protease inhibitor Tolovid compare with Paxlovid? Does it appear to have any therapeutic benefit? So I do not know if the Tolovid has Ritonovir in it. Plus, the Paxlovid, other than having a Ritonovir, which would allow a longer duration of life for proteases, the at least uh, Paxlovid's protease is directed at the virus's protease instead of general proteases. So I don't think Tolovid is for SARS-CoV-2's specific protease, but it is for general proteases. Uh, 
<laughs> this is a good question. Wow, I love you guys today. The questions are awesome. So hi, Dr. Bean. T helper one and T helper two were mentioned a lot in your lectures, yes. However, I've heard also of T helper 17 and T reg, yes. What are they? So the there was a time we only knew about T helper one and two. And then what happened was they were regulatory cells as well. Let me see if I can find a map. They were regulatory cells as well that would whose job was that when the war starts, our body is such an amazing thing. When the war starts, it already puts in place the mechanisms to then calm it down. So it determines prehand how long the fight should continue and then it should cool down. The regulatory cells are in that category. Their function, they are called T helper 17, and their function is to kind of cool down the uh, the inflammation. So T cell types. It is actually such an interesting thing. One of our partner organization who is auditing us and saying we are just not good for doctors. One of their their um, accusation on my teaching was that I said monocyte can be in classical and non-classical state. And they said this doesn't happen. And look, if I just said go, go over here and say monocyte, classical, non-classical, you will actually see many subsets of monocytes. I just clicked any very first one and you would see over here circulating monocyte subsets and I'm sure you would see over here if I just search for it, classical. So here look, namely in humans, three circulating monocyte subsets are three are classified based on the relative expression levels of CD14 and CD16 surface proteins, namely classical, intermediate, and non-classical. And they also say, I believe in this paper, they say that intermediates can transfer themselves to become classical or non-classical. So based on body's need, classical can transition into non-classical by first becoming intermediate and then becoming non-classical. And similarly, non-classical can transition to classical by becoming intermediate. So they can phase switch themselves. They, my our partner said, what are you talking about? Classical, non-classical? Th this is audit medical content auditors. Okay, anyways, uh, back here to your question. T cells. I'm just trying to see if I can have a... So here... Uh, I want to have a more in a better diagram. Uh, yeah, this one is. So if you see here, again, this is somebody's diagram. This is their copyrighted material. And the menu is bigger. So if you see here, the T cells, see T regulatory cell, oh man. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So T regulatory cells, T helper 17 cells, T helper 1 cells, T helper 2 cells. And they're showing various interleukins that trigger a naive T cell to become that. For example, if you take a naive T cell and attach it to a macrophage or a dendritic cell, which I make all the time, then you put various kind of interleukins on it and it would turn into various kind of T cells. For example, if you put interleukin 6 on it, it will become T helper 22. If you put tumor growth factor and IL-6, it will become T helper 17. If you put IL-12 interferon gamma, then it would become T helper 1, IL-4, T helper 2, T tumor growth factor and IL-2, T regulatory cells, and so on. So you can actually then see that regulatory cell is responsible for regulating the immune system's behavior. So helper 17 and regulatory are kind of tasks with the job of uh, regulating the immune system's behavior. Good question. What happened today? All good questions today. So this is a good question. Aspire Pilates and Fitness says, should everyone get their D-dimers checked after COVID? I think it is good to check them after or during just to make sure, just for the peace of mind. 
but not everyone has been doing it. I'll go back to my drawings. Budesonide, the gold country says, hey, gold, how are you? Is budesonide useful for treatment of variants? I haven't heard it mentioned in many months. So variant has no bearing on the budesonide's behavior because budesonide is mostly working with the immune system side and kind of modulating their behavior in the respiratory airways. So regardless of variants, it would work. If it works, then it would work. If it doesn't work, it won't work. <laughs> that is good. Fried Chicken says, if you love Dr. Bean's art, say I love your art. Thank you very much. I love making art. <laughs> Michelle says, no, Bean used to go on Jeopardy. You, you guys put a Jeopardy in front of me every day. Yeah, this is a good idea, Carol says. Carol, how is Raj? You, you are Carol Raj's mom, right? So I remember this very often. I hope you are the Carol with Raj, Raj's mom. Luffy has started going out at night. So he wakes up like a clockwork at three o'clock at night, goes to the front door and wants to be go, let out. And so I haven't put those little doors because I'm afraid if Kyrie would go out and there are doors with the sensors as well, so we'll do that. But today, I go out and open the door and he goes for the night and he comes back five or six in the morning. So we say that he goes to his office at night, then comes back at six, eats, drinks, then goes out again, then comes back about eight, nine, and then sleeps. He has, uh, so yes, <laughs> thank you very much for the like buttons too. <laughs> Raj wakes me up at 4.30 and like clockwork. That is so funny. Margaret says, I love your art. Thank you very much. Frank and Tronic says, 414 watching, only 173 likes. Let's give Dr. Bean some thumbs up. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Denise says, I love your art, but you, you know that already. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let's see. Question, hi, Dr. Queen. Omicron and overweight, when boosted? So, usually, Omicron has changed some dynamics. But usually the antibodies from the vaccine start waning after six months. But you may have seen that uh, CDC has revised their guidance to say, take a booster after five months. I think that they would further revise it to say earlier. So if somebody, this is a different discussion. How effective are the vaccines? I know I'm going to get the comments that, hey, vaccines are not effective and this is becoming more and more prevalent, this message. But there are spike proteins against which we can still make antibodies and we can still protect people. So if somebody is at risk, as you're saying here, then taking a booster whenever you can, considering all the risk factors and everything, if you then decide to have a booster, at least two to three months later, booster would help. But guidance at this time is five months. For Johnson & Johnson, guidance is two months later. If Omicron uses cathepsins, will cattle blockers like ascentin work and hydroxy? Yes. So Nipa, Nipa Gandhi from India, she sent me a text saying, well, if it is the cathepsins, and they are becoming active with the lower pH, then the hydroxy causes the pH to stay higher, and that would re reduce the activation of cathepsin. So won't that work? And I said, yeah, that would work. So yes. Saswati says, thank you very much. 
I hope, uh, Saraswati, you and your family, you guys are doing okay. <laughs> Denise says, sounds like Luffy has a long hauling insomnia. He just wants to give everyone else long hauling insomnia. <laughs> You you betcha says, Dr. Bean, don't put the doors on because you get raccoons and possums in your house. Well, I would love to have a zoo then. <laughs> yoga and meditation and Reiki. Yes, agreed. Meditation I do every day. Yoga, whenever my son catches me, says, all right, let's go do some exercises. Metasic says, Look at some cat ears. These are great for wandering. Wondering. I will send you a link. Thank you. Carolyn says, I love your art. Thank you. I have been meaning to put up the Luffy channel for two days now. And I just keep doing these things and I don't get a chance. But I have so many small clips of Luffy and Kyrie, and I hope that they will be fun. My my family thinks I've gone crazy. I'm running after the the cats all the time with the camera. I need little snippets. Nipa, thank you very much for your for uh, discussing that. You are you are the best. Jamil Azal says, "Would you take boosters?" So that is a loaded question for me. Here is why. One, I feel that Omicron is becoming easier. I don't have any comorbidities so far. Fingers crossed. I hope I don't jinx it. I also have someone who got um, side effects in the vaccine that are not over yet. So I am a little hesitant for the booster. Plus, I'm hoping that maybe I would not need it. Um, we'll see. I actually think about it every day. So Frank Frankentronic says, is Luffy channel up? Not yet. So I have to bring it up. I have so many tiny little videos of Luffy. He's <laughs> in love, Dr. Bean. Love back at you. Grace says, I miss your lectures, your art in Luffy, Dr. Bean. Thanks. Miss you as well. <laughs> Look at the icon. You have a so this is what Luffy does. Every morning when I go down, he is jumping up on the door and trying to open it by himself. Texas says, I have grandfather baby videos in Discord. Go for it. Thank you. I'm going to go check them out. <laughs> Patty says, Dr. Moran's main coon have their own channel. That is so funny. So Mike Gardner says, how long can Omicron float in the air and infect someone? So we have had the, those discussions before. That is still a debate going on that is it aerosolized or not? I believe it is aerosolized. If it is aerosolized, it can stay in the environment for a couple of hours even when the person has gone. Now the amount of load present in the air that can be dangerous is still not fully vetted out. So there was a guidance to say 15 minutes in a doctor's room is sufficient to ca cause others to have it. So I think if the room is ventilated, if it is cleaned, if the um, load is not that much, if the size is bigger, then all those dynamics change the situation. It's a good question. <clears throat> so Jody says, my daughter wants to visit, has been symptomatic 10 days, still waiting for a test result from a New York tent. Is she infectious still? So she could still be, if she is symptomatic, then she still could be shedding. That is the thing. For example, my friend in Dubai, 10 days in hospital, yesterday's PCR came negative and today's was positive. So 10 days after, 
she was still positive and they were giving her steroids and their own protocol says don't give steroid to someone who has a virus so it is possible <laughs> so skyfrog i've been thinking about that so i was thinking maybe i should call it luffy and kairi so that kairi gets uh, appropriate um, exposure as well kairi is the silent one she doesn't bother anyone she doesn't mew that much and she is very careful for going out as well she doesn't go too far so she's all very nice cat but luffy is the brat that kind of uh, i've seen that when luffy's out at night then kairi plays the whole remaining night but if luffy's around she would just sit somewhere so yes we will will name it luffy and kairi margaret says making short story videos of cats and dogs takes a lot of time and energy yep i'm going to try to make it <laughs> um Hypercat says, Hypercar Market says, dexamethasone shows cat cattle inhibitory properties. Does that mean dexamethasone will be better to treat Omicron than methylprednisone? Yes, for cathepsin. The question is, will they be giving dexamethasone in the viral stage where cathepsin's blockade is needed? If they're not going to give it in viral stage, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> Colleen says, I love your channel. My hubby isn't medically minded, but told me about you. Thank you very much, and please thank him as well. Hmm. So Erica says, have your cats been fixed? Me, two dogs, one male, one female. No, and nothing happened. So um, the Bengals, I think that there is a regulation for California that they cannot be not fixed. So they were that way when we got them. Okay, so here we are, 8 o'clock. Bambi is here, so let's have a question from Bambi. Dr. Bean Medical, can you show Dr. Eric Levy video on nasal swab technique to help cool beans do rapid tests properly? Too many poor techniques on news. Let's see. So Dr. Eric Levy. Nasal... Can I make it bigger? Yes. Okay, so let me... Okay. So if you were swimming in this direction, you are going to hit a narrow roof. It's painful. Don't do that. The nose goes back and down. Secondly, I see a lot of people doing something like this. Now, that's not great sampling. That is just swabbing the hairy skin of the nose of the front. What we want to get is the mucosa, the respiratory lining of the nose, which is down and back. So please go flat, aim backwards, and go slow, go low. And that would be the way. About two to three centimeters around the back, Go low and go slow, and then you can throw for 15 seconds, and then you pull it out. Have a great new year. <laughs> oh, that sounded very painful, but yeah, that is the correct way to do it. Thank you very much, Bambi, for this uh, community service. <laughs> Jody said the same thing. I have had this done to me because uh, I think last year when I developed cold like symptoms, I went to get that. And she was, she did this. 
Okay, so um, let's continue tomorrow and we'll go from there. Stay safe, happy and healthy. Please take care of yourself. I try for whatever I can do for myself as well. So please uh, stay safe and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. And then my last customary thing, like, subscribe, and share. If subscribe and share is not fun, then just like it. And if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal or you can be a patron. Thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.